Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous et bienvenue dans ce nouveau webinaire de la Britcham, la Chambre britannique de commerce. Ravi de vous accueillir. Nous allons parler d'un sujet d'importance aujourd'hui, l'accord d'association entre le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni. Voilà près de deux ans qu'il est entré en vigueur. Euh, quel bilan, quel premier bilan et surtout, quelle nouvelle étape entre le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni euh, C'est ce que nous allons voir. Mais tout de suite, avant de débuter ce webinaire, la parole au président de la Britcham. Mr. Stephen Orr. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, Landry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of Brit uh, it's nice to meet you again for this evening's event. On the menu this Thursday, November the 24th, there's a question. What next step after the association agreement between Morocco and the United Kingdom? As you know, it will soon be two years since this agreement entered into force. Morocco was the first country to have ratified an association agreement with the UK out of the EU. In 2021, trade between our two countries increased by more than 7%, and Morocco exports in particular experienced a good increase with nearly 14%. Since then, discussions have accelerated to go even further and strengthen the commercial and economic dynamics of our exchanges. Last July, the British minister in charge of relations with North Africa was visiting Rabat. He announced that he wanted a new bilateral partnership based on education and green finance. Agriculture and trade are also essential pillars of our trade. The United Kingdom and Morocco are getting closer and closer and dreaming big. Proof of this in particular, this project for the largest electrical cable in the world carried out by the British startup X-Link. So what is the first assessment to draw after almost two years of the association agreement? What are the future prospects? What can be the new step of this association agreement between Morocco and the United Kingdom? This is what we'll be seeing during this webinar with His Excellency Simon Martin, Her Britannic Majesty's Ambassador in Morocco. Thank you, Simon, for being with us this evening. We will also see in detail what the statistics are after Brexit and what are the main post-Brexit achievements with Mr. Tom Hill, Consul General of the United Kingdom and DIT Director in Morocco. And we will ask him what updates to expect on the trade date. Thank you, Tom, for accepting our invitation. And finally, we will talk about an ambitious project, that of interconnecting Morocco and the United Kingdom, the x links project. Announced in September 2021, it consists of connecting Morocco to the United Kingdom by cable, providing clean electricity produced by the sun and the desert wind. How did the idea for this interconnection come about, and on what step is the project currently? And how to strengthen relations between Morocco and the United Kingdom on green energy? Mr. Simon Morris, CEO of Excellence, will answer us these questions. Thank you, Mr. Morris, for being with us this evening. This webinar is yours as the members, so do not hesitate to ask any questions. Before giving the floor to our moderator, Laundry Benoit, I would like to thank our partners, OCP Group, Spirit Aero Systems, Bank of Africa, Consumar, Aqua Group, British International Group, h and Investment, and GSK. So thank you, everyone, for this evening's webinar. Merci Stephen Orr, président de la Bridgeham. On vous retrouve bien sûr tout au long de, de ce webinaire également. Euh, bonsoir et encore une fois bienvenue à tous. On va donc euh, passer au crible le premier bilan de cet accord d'association. Cela fait près de deux ans qu'il est entré en, en vigueur maintenant. Et puis tracer euh, la route pour la suite. Quelle nouvelle étape euh, euh, le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni peuvent franchir ensemble euh, Monsieur Stephen Orr, rappelez effectivement que les exportations ont été largement en hausse euh, durant ces premiers mois d'accord d'association, ça continue à être le cas. Euh, rien que pour le secteur, notamment euh, des exportations de fruits et légumes du Maroc envers euh, le Royaume-Uni, nous sommes à plus de 40% euh, de hausse. Et encore, il y a un projet de, de route maritime qui est en, en, en cours actuellement et qui pourra ouvrir de, de nouvelles horizons. Mais il y a des secteurs, euh, forcément, qui vont être appelés à être renforcés à l'avenir. La finance verte, l'éducation, l'agriculture ou encore euh, eh bien, les énergies renouvelables. C'est de tout cela dont nous avons parlé dans ce webinaire avec euh, trois intervenants de marque, Monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon Martin. Good evening. Good evening, Landry. Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Également, I, uh, d'être avec okay, vous. Good. Great, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, cool. Également avec nous, le consul général du Royaume-Uni et directeur du département euh, du commerce euh, ici au, au Maroc. Uh, good evening, Tom Hill. Good evening. Uh, 
thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to meet all of you, uh, many of you, for the first time. Un plaisir partagé. Hey, Simon Maurice, good evening. Uh, good evening. It's an honor to be here today. Directeur général de X-Links, le grand projet, un projet fantastique dont vous nous parlerez tout à l'heure, peut-être le plus grand câble électrique au monde entre le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni. Ça fait maintenant un peu plus d'un an que ce projet a été annoncé en grande pompe. Ça avance, ça avance. On fera un point avec vous et on regardera justement votre vision des perspectives d'avenir pour le marché ici au Maroc, le marché des, des énergies vertes, des énergies renouvelables. Mais d'abord la parole donc à, à monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon Martin. Euh, je ne vais pas passer par quatre chemins, j'ai envie de vous poser la première question pour avoir directement des premières informations. Deux ans après cet accord, pratiquement deux ans après l'entrée en vigueur de cet accord d'association, euh, quels sont les résultats de cet accord aujourd'hui So, Mr. Ambassador, two years after, what are the results of the association agreement Morocco-UK post-Brexit? Great. Okay. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you, Laundry. Um, thank you to Brit Cham and for all of our, our uh, wonderful supporting uh, companies for, uh, uh, for, for wanting uh, us to have this webinar this evening. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that you've got uh, Uh, three of us who are going to present and we want to get um, questions from our participants. So um, I will uh, confine myself to some to, to one of the sort of high level answering of that question because I know that my colleague uh, Tom Hill uh, will be able to, to, to fill in more of the detail. So two years on, I mean, in fact, we can we can go back uh, six years to the to the vote in the UK, uh, which really started to trigger a, uh, a change in, uh, uh, in the mentality of the UK relationship. Um, and it's really noticeable um, how the Moroccan government um, identified Brexit um, as an opportunity for both the UK and for Morocco. Now, this doesn't mean uh, any turning away from, from existing partners. It is simply that the Moroccan government had the uh, the perception to see that, that what was offered here to a a a major but but as yet you know underdeveloped partnership like that between the uk uh, and morocco was 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 ripe for some real effort um and so it should be should have been no surprise to our predecessors that in 2018 um the the uh, the first uh, continuation association agreement between the uk And one of the partners um, of the European Union, um, uh, the first country uh, to be ready to sign that partnership was indeed Morocco. Um, and uh, so two years on, you could argue um, that we would all, of course, love uh, to have seen uh, an even greater explosion in the, uh, in the economic relationship Uh, we have in some ways been hampered by COVID, of course. Um, um, but also, we have both of us found that there is, uh, there is quite a lot involved in, in, um, in a gentle way dismantling the UK-Morocco uh, structures when we were, were all within the EU-Morocco Association Agreement and rediscovering and rebuilding them um, as, a, as a bilateral relationship. Uh, and I think it's worth just mentioning the point that the, 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 the transformation here has been from uh, a, uh, a formal treaty-bound relationship between Morocco on the one side, 28 EU member states on the other side, all have to agree on, one, uh, one, on, on each individual issue, to a situation where the UK and Morocco um, are equal partners on either side. Uh, with no other countries um, to, uh, to, to take fully into account. So this is what we now have in front of us, um, and we are, we are uh, exploring how we can best take advantage of that. Uh, we had our first meeting of the what's called the Trade Subcommittee of the Association Council in London this summer. It's the first in-person meeting we had been able to hold uh, following the various uh, lockdowns. Um, And this involved 
experts in trade and agriculture and uh, customs and so on, um, starting to really get into the detail of how we can sweep away some of the obstacles that we've inherited from that previous uh, relationship uh, and, and really start to liberate trade between us. Now, the UK and Morocco have been uh, partners, have had uh, direct relations for over 800 years. The first treaty, as you will all know, uh, was signed just over 300 years ago, and we celebrated the 300th anniversary of that last year in 2021. Um, but it is fair to say that over the period from the start of the 20th century, um, the UK and Morocco have rather overlooked the potential of this relationship. Um, and so it is, a, it is a combined determination now, a shared determination, to elevate this relationship to where it could reasonably be. Uh, it's noticeable that the Moroccan government has said publicly, we aspire to see the UK up in its top five uh, trading partners. We're at the moment around 11 or 12. Um, so it gives you an idea of the, uh, of the level of ambition. Um, my contention is that we now have the uh, we have the, the government structure to help us make that happen. I think what's really important also is to see how companies on both sides are really starting to wake up to to the opportunities. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, and I'll come back to the reasons for some of this later on. Even during my two years here, we have seen the number of British schools in Morocco going up from three recognized officially recognized british schools to seven um we are hoping inshallah croissant le um mm -hmm. to have the announcement of the first uh campus of a british university here this is a really good example uh not only of the uh of the mutual interest between our two countries but also uh as a real as a real example of how we see uh, actually physical investment coming in, even into the education sector. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of, of going to Marrakesh this weekend, the first Marrakesh English Book Festival, uh, the first, as I say, such uh, occasion, both celebrating um, the, uh, not only the, the interest in, in English literature here, and indeed there is so much English language literature written in and about Morocco, but actually seeing this also as an opportunity to explore some of the challenges for increasing uh, the availability of these uh, really important uh, materials on the, on the Moroccan market, which Tom and I, I know, will be taking back with us the messages to our government-to-government -government, uh, association uh, council uh, on how we can uh, smooth the trade um, in these areas. Now, uh, other evidence um, of, the, of the impetus and the energy in the relationship is the fact that when uh, AMDI and the Moroccan uh, Ministry for Industry and Trade decided to launch the Morocco Now brand, which is, which is the, uh, uh, the campaign to promote Moroccan exports and investment in Morocco, uh, the first overseas market in which this brand was launched was the UK. We had a uh, a very high profile event. Thank you uh, to, uh, to Stephen for your participation in that as well in, in London in February. Um, and uh, uh, since then, we have, uh, we have seen um, a number of very uh, high profile projects being proposed. One or two have started already. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, uh, from Simon Morris a bit later on, on, on what um, by anybody's standards would be a game changer in any economic relationship between any two countries. And we are um, very, very excited, enthusiastic about the possibility of that. And Simon, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, even more about that, uh, although I, uh, I see it as one of the most important things that's going on between the UK and Morocco um, already. But we, we have other British companies who are already engaged in investing in renewable energy. Uh, I um, uh, was, was uh, introduced to a proposal for a, uh, a major development uh, involving high efficiency, low water usage agriculture um, uh, just the other day. 
Um, and uh, just yesterday, uh, about a, a major uh, cluster investment that was being proposed in green hydrogen. Now, we all, we, we're all very much aware that the, the renewable energy is one of Morocco's great, uh, great natural resources at the moment. Um, green hydrogen is a technology which is being developed at speed um, to take advantage of, of uh, green energy um, uh, and to create a, a transportable uh, zero emission fuel source. So um, it's fantastic to see how Morocco is looking to be at the leading edge of this industry. Um, and so much interest from UK investors as well as uh, UK industry. Um, Stephen, you mentioned green finance. Um, I am really excited about the prospect of developing even greater links between the city of London and the Casablanca finance city. Um, we had a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, event organized by Infraco, the, um, the uh, uh, UK government development finance institution that's responsible for uh, encouraging and investing uh, from the private sector into, Afri into African infrastructure uh, in Casablanca Finance City a couple of months ago. Um, and to see the amount of interest from London in the Casablanca Finance Centre was really quite special. Um, I think we can all um, identify ways in which we would make it easier for, for example, British financial services and professional services companies to operate in Morocco and then through Morocco across wide, more widely into Africa. Um, and I think as Tom is going to touch on in a minute, we are keen now that we have our new structures in place um, to, to identify those key obstacles that we see those, if you like, regulatory and um, uh, rule-related obstacles um, to making um, the, uh, the, 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 the flow uh, of companies between our two countries and the establishment of one and the other more easy. Uh, it's not just about breaking down obstacles here, it's breaking obstacles into the UK as well. Um, and that's why we're so proud of this uh, bilateral arrangement we've got. Um, I am confident that where we are now, Tom is going to talk a little bit about the, 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 the statistics of how the trade relationship is going. I am confident that this is only going to grow um, and that the more success we see, the more success we will, we will, we will see following it. Um, the last uh, sector I wanted to mention was mining, um, where we have um, considerable uh, interest already um, in mining projects, uh, copper, tin, uh, some rare earth metals and so on, um, and a very uh, large scale project which we hope will be uh, announced very soon uh, to start developing potash in, uh, uh, in Morocco. Um, this will be yet another way um, following the extraordinary work of OCP that Morocco contributes to the uh, efficient development of African agriculture, potash being such an important in, uh, in fertilizer production. So, um, uh, as I say, there is, uh, there is a lot going on. I'm really, really proud to see, even as we still bounce back from COVID, just the way in which our uh, economic relationship is growing. Anyone who tries to get a flight to London at the moment will realize just how, uh, how much interest there is. Um, and um, uh, I am confidently pre pre predicting that what we will see is an exponential growth. The more, the, the more success we see, the more success we will want to see. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I look forward to uh, taking questions afterwards, um, but also to coming back and uh, allowing myself to be proved right or wrong in the months to come. I think I'll stop there and, and hand back to you, Landry, but thank you. Donc, beaucoup, beaucoup d'ambition, beaucoup de confiance également. On l'entend, hein, Simon Martin, Monsieur l'ambassadeur. Mm. Euh, on rappelle ce chiffre, 1,8 milliard de livres sterling, c'est le montant des échanges commerciaux et économiques entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni euh, euh, l'an dernier. Euh, néanmoins, il y a un contexte général. Alors, il y a eu le Covid-19, il y a l'inflation, la crise économique. Euh, quel impact euh, ces trois facteurs ont aujourd'hui dans, dans les relations entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni 
Mr. Ambassador, inflation, COVID-19 and the economic crisis, how deep are their impact to UK and to the exchange between the two countries? Well, we've, we've seen, um, we've seen uh, how the impact of the first two of those uh, things uh, have had um, in, um, uh, you know, in the global economy. Um, some of the impacts uh, have been uh, asymmetrical. So, for example, the, uh, the shipping industry um, has not recovered from COVID-19. The, the supply of so many products in the, in the Far East have by no means recovered. The cost of shipping from the Far East to Europe is still far, far higher than it was in the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, and we've all seen the, uh, uh, the ongoing response of the Chinese authorities is causing further um, uh, issues with, uh, with the supply chain from the Far East. Uh, anyone who's heard uh, Minister Riyad Mazur, the His Excellency, the Minister for Industry and Trade, knows that, that without wanting to, 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 to appear opportunistic, Morocco rightly sees itself uh, as an extraordinarily um, uh, efficient and developed manufacturing base, um, literally on the border of Europe. Um, and so uh, we have seen uh, a fair amount of, uh, of interest already um, in, in companies who may have uh, been seeking uh, offshore uh, manufacturing platforms or may have had to shift uh, already uh, offshore platforms to elsewhere and looking to come into Morocco, whether it's in the manufacture of uh, renewable energy equipment in fruit processing is another. And, uh, and so, although we have all suffered uh, from the effects of COVID-19 and the inflation that has followed, um, there are already some ways in which you can see that, that the UK-Morocco relationship with its new flexibility and dynamism um, has benefited. Now, um, at the same time, the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine um, which has led to so much disruption in the, um, uh, in the energy and particularly food uh, sectors, um, has at the same time uh, brought about quite a lot of, um, uh, of rapid reform. Uh, it certainly has sharpened the, uh, the appreciation in Europe for the need to find alternatives to the sources of hydrocarbons. Uh, and again, we'll be hearing from Simon how that affects the economics of a uh, of a project like X-Links. Um, it also sharpens the case for strategic investment in, in, uh, in the agricultural sector. And as I say, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, at one in particular mining project, which is going to be transformative in that way, inshallah. And, uh, but also in, uh, uh, in investments from, uh, from companies who see the, see the opportunity to, uh, to develop Morocco's uh, agricultural sector further from outside. So um, yes, we have we have been uh, held back. Uh, the world economy has been held back. We all know that. Um, um, we've had further disruption in the UK um, over this summer with changes of government. We are through that now, um, and we are in the in the process of uh, of consolidating the gains that, uh, that we have all since the uh, the EU exit. Um, and um, I have to say that as British ambassador, there is nowhere I would rather be to, 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 to really see those benefits come in than, than, than here in Morocco. Um, the, in, in, some, in some countries, the UK's position is such that you feel as if you're already up near the ceiling. In Morocco, we, there is, we cannot see the sky. There is so much for the UK uh, and Morocco to do together. Um, and for those who've heard me speak before, it, it may be that this is a repetition, but it's something that's worth repeating. When you analyze as an economist the UK-Morocco economic relationship, you find very, very few examples of where the UK and Morocco are in competition with each other, where UK and Moroccan suppliers and producers um, are competitive. It, there is so much that is, um, that, that is complementary about our economies. Um, that I believe that there is a great deal to do in almost every sector. And I was very proud to see um, at the embassy last night, the launch of the UK export finance presence in Morocco. So 
This is what used to be known as the Export Credits Guarantees Department, a standard, a rather sort of reactive um, uh, export finance, export credit provider, um, who are now active partners in putting together um, uh, competitive um, consortia to, to, to bid for large-scale projects, as well as to support more straightforward exports, um, who have put aside four billion pounds of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of financing for the Moroccan market to support not just British exports, because of course that's partly what they do, UK export finance, the clues in the name, but also um, uh, with, a, with a level of um, flexibility um, that allows a great deal of collaboration, whether it's in a, an agriculture project, uh, a renewable energy project, or indeed a major infrastructure project like the extension of the uh, Linea à grande vitesse down towards uh, Marrakech. These are all these are all possibilities, and we have we have got the tools uh, and we have got the interest um, to 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 really take it forward. So I think if the hint in your question, Laundry, was Am I disappointed that we haven't already advanced further? I am ambitious. I am always looking for us to, to move quicker and, and, and further. But uh, I think you will see as the world gets back on its feet, um, this relationship really taking off. Donc, la, la, la nouvelle étape, elle peut se dessiner sur plusieurs, euh, plusieurs secteurs d'activité. On peut aller beaucoup plus loin, renforcer davantage la présence britannique ici au Maroc. So the Morocco-UK relations, what do you think is the real next step? Well, we, we already have a, um, uh, a, a, strong, um, uh, a strong team in, um, in, the, in the Consulate General in, in Casablanca. This is our, uh, our team, all, all, all working to our Department for International Trade. And so their focus is on uh, on helping British exporters and investors, but he's also about uh, managing this uh, this this new trade negotiation that we can we can at last carry out uh, now that we're outside the European Union, and um, and so it, it is it, it is this ability to uh, to change the 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 uh, uh, the uh, of our, uh, of our economic relationship, which is one thing that you're going to see the result of laundry. Um, but the other thing uh, that I am very confident is, is, is looking at increasing evidence of, um, of, of, of visible evidence of our bilateral exchanges. Of course, um, uh, everybody wants to hear more about X-Links. This is, this is what we uh, uh, are looking forward to uh, uh, to seeing um, as a as a physical embodiment of this new relationship, but I, as I mentioned, I I, I don't want to uh, appear to put uh, pressure on anyone making any decisions. But we have a number of other really significant projects that once we can announce them, um, you will see we will all see the you know, the physical evidence, and this will be supported then by. Uh, uh, the more that uh, that we facilitate this trade, the more interest there will be. Uh, back to this point that's really, really important. You know, Morocco buys from the UK what Morocco doesn't produce itself in general. Um, the UK buys from Morocco what the what the UK itself doesn't produce. And then when it comes to the to the fruit and the legume uh, that, that you mentioned earlier on. Even those products that we do grow in the UK, they ripen at different times of year. There's this remarkable complementarity between our two um, economies. Uh, and so we will simply be seeing more and more of that. And I hope um, when you go and do your shopping in Marjan and, uh, and Carrefour, um, you know, you, we will see more British products there in the same way that when my mother goes shopping at Marks and Spencers and Waitrose and Sainsbury's in the UK, Every day, she tells me, I have seen Moroccan products here, I've seen Moroccan products there, we'll see more of it. Um, and uh, it's, by, it's no accident talking about these products that the UK has been given the honor 
um, of being the guest country of honor at SIAM, the uh, Salon International uh, de l'Agriculture au Maroc um, in, uh, in Meknes next year. Uh, and this is something that we're really looking forward to taking advantage of. Uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, dernière question, peut-être les, les prochains mm. projets à venir. Tout à l'heure, vous parliez du campus universitaire britannique avec uh, la formulation Inch'Allah, peut-être pour 2023? Inch'Allah, oui. Uh, yes, um, I'm, we very much hope. Um, uh, it's a complicated sector, um, universities. Um, it, there's, it's such an important sector for, for our uh, young people, but also for our, the, the future formation of our, uh, of our, of our populations. But uh, it's not an easy, not an easy thing to, uh, to, to change. Um, and so we have had to be um, resourceful together with the really, really helpful Ministry for Higher Education. And that's why it's taken a bit longer than we had hoped. But we very much hope in 2023, not just to announce, but to see the opening of the first campus of a, of a British university. And this is really important to me. It is responding to uh, an extraordinary surge in, the, in, in demand for English language education here in Morocco. Um, uh, a study by the um, British Council last year of uh, put questions to a group of, of Moroccans between the ages of 15 and 25 and over 70 percent of them said that they could imagine English becoming more important than French within the next five years. Um, I, uh, uh, I don't know whether they hoped that or they really thought it but it gives you an idea uh, and uh, a study of 300,000 Moroccan parents by the uh, Moroccan parliament uh, recently um, asked the parents the question, which languages would you like your children to learn? And English came out on top, was the one that, that people identified even above French or Arabic. So um, this is the way it's going. Well, I'm really, really keen. I'm so happy to see the numbers of, of, of British, of Moroccan students studying at British universities increase. The more people who study in another country, the, the greater the quality and the, the volume of exchange you have. But it feels to me that what will make the biggest difference is when that um, really world-class British university education becomes available here in Morocco. Um, uh, and then it is not just those who are lucky enough to be able to study overseas. It will be open to a much, much wider um, part of the of the population than that. So although I'm delighted as the numbers um, of people studying in the UK has gone up, um, it feels to me that there is another prize there, which is to bring uh, even more British education to Morocco, make it more accessible to more young Moroccans. Um, and then, you know, it will just continue to, uh, to, to accelerate these exchanges that we're already encouraging and we're already seeing. Merci, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Simon Martin. On vous retrouve bien sûr tout au long de ce webinaire avec la séance des, des questions-réponses euh, tout à l'heure en, en fin de débat. Euh, Peut-être juste avant de donner la parole à, à Monsieur euh, Tom Hill, le consul général du, du Royaume-Uni et euh, directeur du DIT ici au Maroc. Euh, Stephen Orr, vous qui êtes président de la Bridge quelle est votre vision pour l'instant sur euh, cet accord d'association entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni so what is your vision to the trade the association agreement, Stephen? Stephen, you are with us? Yes, uh, I'm with you. Thank you. Is this for, uh, sorry, was the question addressed to me or to Stephen? Mm -hmm. Not to Stephen, <laughs> but uh, I think he's not responding. So. Sinon, on reposera la question tout à l'heure à, à Stephen Orr. On va peut-être euh, justement donner la parole à, à Tom Hill. Uh, good evening, encore une fois. Uh, Tom Hill, uh, peut-être avec vous, on va approfondir les, les impacts uh, en chiffres de cet accord d'association entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni. Uh, la première question que je voudrais uh, vous aborder avant d'entrer dans le vif du sujet sur les statistiques, uh, c'est quelle mise à jour on peut attendre de cet accord d'association qui fêtera en janvier prochain ces deux ans d'entrée en vigueur. 
Uh, Tom, uh, what are the updates to expect on the trade agreement between the two countries? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, first, first of all, um, pleasure to be talking to you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at a, another venue, and uh, it turns out that the, the, uh, my car is the quietest spot. So, uh, excuse the background. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, the ambassador covered it very well. But I think just to give you some, um, some data, uh, UK Morocco trade is worth about was worth two billion pounds in 2021 this makes morocco the uk's 57th largest trading partner uh, and it makes the uk roughly um morocco's 11th largest trading partner uh, and the uk investment stock in morocco is worth about 1.2 billion uh, and obviously if some of the projects that we've been talking about on on today's uh, webinar go through then um you know that number will substantially change um and i think that's a very good example of um you know, the sky being uh, the limit uh, with, with regards to our bilateral trade and investment relationship. Uh, with regards to the association agreement, so so yes, on the 1st of January 2020, sorry, 2021, uh, the, um, the UK-Morocco association agreement entered into force. Um, so, so ever since then, our two kingdoms have been trading under bilateral terms. Uh, and ever since then, we have had a bilateral framework to engage Morocco uh, with and through. Uh, and what this constitutes is a, is a trade subcommittee uh, and, and an association council. And both of these take place once a year. Uh, and this is, this is very, very exciting, actually. It sounds quite dry, but, it, but it's exciting because the trade subcommittee, which we had in London in July, we had a delegation of 12... Um, colleagues from Moroccan government across Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, Energy, Environment. Uh, we have wide-ranging discussions on our trading relationship. We had discussions on uh, the potential of battery manufacturing in Morocco. We had discussions on, um, on tariffs on uh, tomato for exports from Morocco to the UK, uh, discussions on the viability of digital trade. So, um, uh, whether we could open source um, data so that uh, data could be stored across uh, UK and Moroccan boundaries. We had uh, discussions on procurement uh, and on clean growth and, and renewable investment. So all, all of these uh, um, discussions, you know, they're at an early stage, but I think what's interesting and exciting is that we have a framework um, to to raise anything really that is impacting either Moroccan businesses or UK businesses um, operating in, in this arena. Uh, and in terms of what this means for you, I think um, the point to raise here is that, um, you know, we like to uh, talk a good game in government, but we, we actually don't have anything to talk about without information from, from you as businesses. Uh, it's incredibly important that we we understand what the challenges you're facing are on the ground. Um, are there issues with customs on the UK side? Um, you know, is there a, a particular issue around um, labeling or phytosanitary rules that is uh, impacting your ability to, to trade smoothly with uh, either the UK or Morocco? If we have this information, we can raise it and we can discuss it in these fora. And, um, and that's the, uh, really positive thing that we have now that we didn't have before. Um, so our next association council will be early next year, and then we'll carry on the subcommittees. But I think um, you know one thing I, I, I won't talk too long, but obviously very happy to take questions. Is um, one thing that we'll then move on to is is what's known as a trade agreement modernisation. Um, so both the UK and Morocco incredibly sort of forward-thinking uh, kingdoms with regards to the energy transition with regards to um uh you know digital trade healthcare you know morocco's um reforms in the healthcare sector are incredibly ambitious and we're, we're working to help them with that um we'd like to reflect these changes and this um, forward-thinking nature of the two kingdoms in a modern and ambitious trade agreement uh, and as you know the uk um is in a position where we're negotiating a, a lot of trade agreements at once um but you know we are very much pushing morocco um 
to be um you know to feature as a as a as an agreement that we we prioritize and we push because the opportunity uh, is so large um so yeah thank you and uh, and just to just to summarize uh, you know please do um feel free uh, anyone on the call to contact us with challenges or issues that you're coming across uh, with regards to trade because um, you know we really do want to hear it uh, and and hopefully try and address it thank you Thomas Hill, quels sont les, les principaux, selon vous, les principaux secteurs euh, d'activité où euh, on doit renforcer euh, la relation entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni? So, thank you, Tom. Uh, next question is what are the main sectors where we need to strengthen the relations between Morocco and the UK? Well, I think the sectors that we see as uh, as a priority um, are renewable energy, and I think um, you know, Simon. Um, uh next we'll be able to sort of um talk about that better than i uh healthcare and I, i've already discussed how um uh you know morocco's ambitions to increase healthcare coverage from 30 percent to over 90 percent align really well um to the uk's capability so medical equipment the uk already exports about five million pounds worth of medical equipment to morocco um every year um we uh, we're also very strong in terms of human resources and governance of healthcare systems and we're working with morocco to share that um another focus of ours is education and the ambassador covered that um and finally agriculture uh i've, I've been very lucky in my in my time in morocco to be able to visit um a number of uh, a number of sort of farms and obviously uh, fertilizer companies and and the challenges that, that moroccan businesses are dealing with in agriculture particularly with regards to water, um, you know, are very profound. Um, they're being met with a lot of um, ingenuity on the Moroccan side, and there's a lot of kind of capability on the UK side that we can support with. So um, the first step in the agriculture is we're taking a de delegation of Moroccan businesses to LAMA, which is an um, uh, agric agricultural machinery show uh, in Birmingham in January next year. And then we're bringing a delegation of UK businesses out to Morocco in May next year for the Salon International Agricultural du Maroc. Um, so, um, yes, four, four sectors. Obviously, there are other sectors, mining, uh, financial services that are of interest, but those four sectors are where we really see um, substantial potential. Tom Hill, quelles sont les, les statistiques donc, euh, que, que vous avez à disposition pour l'instant après le Brexit euh, sur la relation entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni? So, Tom, any statistic post Brexit? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, trade is up 62%, um, but I think that's less to do with COVID, uh, Brexit and more to do with COVID uh, and the COVID recovery. So it would be a bit uh, cheeky of me to, to quote that. Um, but uh, no, I think um, I think Morocco, you know, Morocco has grown as a UK trade partner. Uh, it was 60th, now it's 57th um and i think you know we see substantial room for growth uh i think i think one of the more you know interesting things talking about sort of um trade is is the the anecdotal picture um and the level of appetite that you see on on both sides both in terms of sort of uk ministers coming out to morocco uk investors um looking at morocco as a market um we're seeing you know a lot of uh a lot of attention from Moroccan ministers in the UK. Um, the energy minister was in the UK recently, the investment minister. Um, there's a real sort of a level of energy um, at a high level um, that we're seeing. And I think that's as telling as, as any statistic at this stage. Merci, Thomas Hill, Consul General du, du Royaume-Uni et euh, Directeur du DIT ici au Maroc. Vous restez bien sûr avec nous pour la, la séance des questions-réponses. On accueille donc également euh, Dans ce webinaire, euh, euh, Monsieur Simon Morish, qui est directeur général de, de X-Links. Euh, Rebonsoir, good evening, uh, Simon Morish. Bonsoir, good evening. Euh, magnifique projet, on le rappelle, plus de 4000 km de câbles sous-marins électriques à l'avenir. Inch'Allah, comme disait euh, l'ambassadeur Simon Martin, euh, entre le Royaume-Uni et le Maroc, euh, électricité qui sera 100% renouvelable, on le rappelle, issue donc euh, de l'éolien et, et, et du solaire. Euh, D'abord, comment est née 
Comment est née l'idée de, de cette interconnexion entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni et quelle est la genèse de, de ce projet So Simon, how did the idea of the Morocco UK interconnection come about and what is the genesis of the project? Well, um, I was actually over in um, California in Silicon Valley in end of 2018 and um, uh, was understanding just how much renew the cost of renewable energy had um, had been plummeting in areas around the world, but especially in, in North Africa and the Middle East. <clears throat> and at the time it was down to as low as $15 per megawatt hour. And understanding just how how the, the sort of the cost of generation in comparable, because uh, I've sort of built over 100 wind tur turbines in the UK, and, and how that varied with the costs in the UK, um, it started me thinking how do we get that how do we get that power back to the UK in the most efficient form and I started researching HBDC connections I understood that China already had 3,000 plus kilometer um, HBDC cables running um, and they, the first the first major one was live already in 2018 and that's at twice the voltage of x -Links and three times the power And so I, I started building a team to look into the feasibility of this. Um, and little did I know that actually the, the main person responsible for driving down the cost of these renewable uh, plants was a gentleman named Paddy Padmanathan, who um, has sort of was started Aqua Power, uh, has built it up to over sort of 80 billion dollars worth of energy assets and has put, I think, about six billion of renewables into, into Morocco, including sort of the world's largest uh, CSP plant. Um, and I'm again, the, the following year, I met him in California and we started talking and uh, he said, oh, my goodness, this is exactly what should be happening. I'm on board. And so he he became my sort of largest shareholder <clears throat> and has been incredibly supportive th throughout this. So um, that's the that's the genesis of it, and, and really, as I started looking at the feasibility and the and the understanding on this, the economics were overwhelming. And so when when we started looking at what what would be the best countries to be able to do this with, Morocco stood out for a whole number of different reasons. Um, for the UK, um, the UK is is facing, and this is before the energy crisis. Um, recently, so created by Russia uh, and, and Ukraine, um, you, the UK was um, was already going to be struggling with uh, meeting its uh, base load renewable energy targets um, because we've got a, a legally mandated um, a, a government uh, law that says we have to be zero carbon by 2035, and we need a huge amount of base load. Um, and most of our nuclear power plants are shutting down. And so looking at, at what the country or the best country to do this with, both geographically and politically, and also the, sort of in terms of the, the level of friendship that we've got with Morocco, it became absolutely clear that Morocco was the right, uh, the right candidate uh, country to work with. And I have to say, since, since that time, um, I have been bowled over by just how professional um, and advanced the Moroccan government are and, and everybody who we've worked with uh, to be able to sort of bring this project forward and to, to, to its sort of realization on there. So um, yeah, Mor Morocco has has only surprised me on the on the positive side just in terms of how um, uh, how, how good it's been to work with. Uh Simon Maurice, pour l'instant, où en est ce projet actuellement? On rappelle qu'il a été annoncé en septembre 2021. So Simon, how far along is the project right now? Um, if uh, if you just want to go forward a couple of pages, there's a nice in infographic on on page three. So next page on there, uh, and and I think this this helps just sort of describe. Uh, the project to those who haven't sort of seen it or come across it um, uh, there. So, so we have we have been working very closely with Moroccan government to secure land um, land in the centre of Morocco. 
uh, and that's in the in the, in the Gumim region. Um, it is it is um, you know a parcel of land, um, and Morocco is very very blessed with lots 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 more of it. Um, I just so you know, a statistic that might be of interesting is if we filled 1.3 percent of the Sahara with solar panels. Um, that would power all of the world's energy needs. So that just gives you an idea in terms of the abundance of, of this kind of resource. Um, what I didn't realize when I first started this, sort of looking at the feasibility of this, was just how good the wind resource was as well. And so we have, we have been working with the UK, with the Moroccan government uh, to secure land on there. We have uh, commenced all the measurement campaigns. We've got 15 MET masts up, and that started at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've started to collect really good data on that, which is confirming all the models, and um, and, and that's very, very powerful. Um, we have uh, completed the environmental studies, the archaeological studies, and the social studies on there, and we've got a, a really good team in Morocco that are working with consultants to to build out the the design of the um, uh, of the facility, and that will house seven gigawatts of solar panels and three and a half gigawatts of wind, um, which with um, which with battery storage will allow us to effectively deliver a baseload equivalent back to the UK. If you just quickly scroll to the next chart, and we'll come back to this one, um, but. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting one for people to sort of see. So you can see the profile of this. In, in, in the orange, you can see the PV, um, and that's a that's a really good PV profile for the UK um, uh, in terms of the time and and when it when it's maximum, it's just it's sort of hitting the early afternoon hours, peak demand in the UK, um, and, and early into the evening, and then <clears throat> with the wind picking up in the evening. Uh, and blowing through the night and dropping again in the morning, you can see again with battery storage, you've got the profile that we're delivering over to the UK, which gives the maximum 3.6 gigawatts of power all during the, the peak of demand um, demand hours in the UK, and then dropping overnight when actually the UK grid wants it the least. And so, in conversations we've had with National Grid, that they've they've said this is this is a more valuable profile to them than nuclear because of its dispatchability, its flexibility, um, uh, and how how the profile drops overnight when actually often the wind's got uh, the UK's got um, abundant wind compared to the demand. So in Morocco, and if you want to go back to the previous previous slide again, um, we are we are in a really good place. Um, we've uh, obviously we've got the sort of uh, the 309 law um, where we're, we've got permission for the export, um, and, um, it, and and that's all moving forward. The next part of the challenge is connecting the cable um, between the UK and Morocco, and we have done three desktop studies on that. The route is 3,800 kilometres. Uh, you'll see it's not the straightest route there, and we've selected a route that goes no deeper than 700 meters all the way through. So it it, it enters the territorial waters of Spain, Portugal, and France. And um, we have started the subsea surveys in August of this year. Uh, those will be continued next year. Um, we have um, uh, ha had some really good progress on that, and the, the gentleman who is leading um, that project is a guy called Nigel Williams, who built the world's longest subsea cable between the UK and Norway, um, which got completed last year at um, uh, on time and 300 million euros under budget. And if you ask him today uh, how technically challenging this is, he said, "Look, the only the only real difficulty here is the length." Um, and overall, it's less technically challenging than the Norway link because there are less cable crossings. There's no Norwegian fjords to, 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 to cross. He's not drilling through mountains and he's not having to lay cable on inland lakes. So um, that, that part of the program is going, is going very well. Um, and then we also ha have the connection in the UK where we have got the the two grid connections of 1.8 gigawatts each into um, 
uh, into Alva Discot, which is in North Devon. Um, and we are we are currently working with the UK government to um, in terms of the offtake at a CFD. And that CFD is is highly competitive. It was competitive before the energy price uh, crisis, and I think in terms of where we are now, it's it, it's even more competitive. Um, overall, the project um, you know this delivers huge benefits for both countries. Um, from from Morocco's end, um, you know the the huge level of job creation that we're doing. We'll be bringing. Um, OEMs and, and we've committed to over 40%, uh, 42% of all of the, the work in Morocco will be done indigenously there. So uh, this really helps the Moroccan um, uh, the, the Moroccan uh, uh, movement towards um, renewable and green power. <clears throat> and this is something that the, the, the king has been has had real foresight in terms of the the overall strategy in Morocco. And I think I was reading um, just last week that Morocco is is ranked the first country in all of Africa in terms of in terms of where it's uh, where it's positioned and, and one of the top in the whole world uh, for its transition to net zero. So Morocco needs a huge congratulations in terms of the foresight and how it how it operates uh, in, in that in that respect. So that gives you a, a sort of a quick nut, sort of a quick uh, overview of um, of the project itself and how how far I think we're progressing. Um, we're expecting to reach financial close in 2024, uh, and then there's a huge build-out program which um, which will take until the end of the decade for the first power to be able to be built. So you, you can take you can take the, the chart down now on there. Simon Morish, peut-être uh, votre regard aujourd'hui sur uh, les perspectives d'avenir uh, entre le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni sur uh, l'énergie renouvelable, comment peut-être renforcer davantage uh, la, la collaboration, la coopération sur ce uh, type de marché entre le Maroc et le Royaume-Uni So Simon, what is your vision to, in order to strengthen the relations between Morocco and the UK on the green energy Well, um... The, 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 I mean, I, I think when Tom talked about uh, Morocco is uh, 57th on the uh, on the UK's sort of trading partner list, uh, Tom, you'll need to run the numbers. But um, so so I haven't even I, I I almost dare not even sort of guess this. But I suspect when this goes live, this will move the trading agreement into the top 10. Um, uh, you know what the, the the sheer volume of trade. That this creates in terms of energy trans, uh, transportation between Morocco and earning earning both Morocco enormous amounts of sort of foreign foreign currency um, will, will will be significant on there. Um, th this will deliver eight percent of the UK's power power requirements, and, and one of the conversations that is most critical to the UK government is they do not want to be beholden to um, to um, melodious regimes like Putin's in Russia, and, and I will I will tell you now one of the reasons. And you asked me sort of about starting Morocco. One of the reasons that, that I started it, um, the primary reason was because I feel passionate about climate change and doing everything I possibly can as a as an entrepreneur and as a business leader in the UK to to, to lead that. But secondary was seeing the um, seeing how um, dependent Europe was on the malevolence of Putin. And I didn't, I didn't predict you, his invasion of, of Ukraine, but I certainly felt that he was going to be uh, using that to, for, for nefarious uh, and um, means. So one of the most important conversations that we're having with the UK government is that we have a really strong and robust relationship with Morocco that is based on true friendship. And I have to say, and I think Simon and his team have been hugely supportive on that front as well, to be able to demonstrate that that is the kind of relationship that we will have, not just next year, but the year after, but also in sort of 50 years time, that this is, this is a, a relationship that we build together and that the UK can rely on uh, Morocco to be a significant source of its 
uh, of its energy uh, long into the future. So that is a that is a basis that friendships are, are built on, and I believe, um, yeah, it, it is a great vision. Um, the other thing I would say is I believe this is the the first project of many, and so we have already been approached by a number of other European countries to say, how can we, uh, can you help us? Okay, this kind of generation profile is which is renewable uh, is um, is completely uncorrelated with with wind, which many of the northern European countries are dependent on in terms of reaching reaching their net zero targets. How can we help? So, I I see this as a stepping stone, as big as it is, to be able to build many many more projects. And I think um, if our hypothesis is right, the whole um, uh, you will start seeing long distance cables connecting various parts of the world, just as we do data cables today. Um, it, what it does is it solves the whole intermittence of renewables. By moving electrons between one region to another, then you no longer have to have long term storage, which, by the way, the only practical thing on the horizon today is, is um, hydroelectric power, which is also expensive and geographically constrained by moving electrons between regions, and that can both be north, south, and east, west, uh, you solve the intermittency of renewables, which are already so much cheaper than fossil fuels, but it absolutely fuels that further. And so th the, the vision for Morocco is, I believe Morocco will be able to be an economic sort of um, powerhouse exporting green electrons to the rest of Europe. Um, and, and that's certainly a, a vision that I would, I would like to be able to help, uh, help Morocco create. Merci beaucoup, Simon Moré. Je vais rester bien sûr avec nous pour, pour les questions. Alors, on a eu beaucoup de questions et des questions, notamment précises. Alors, pour l'ambassadeur, monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon Martin, mais également pour vous, Tom Hill, et pour vous, Simon Moré. D'abord, monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon Martin, on a Hicham qui nous pose la question suivante. À quand des investissements britanniques dans la région de Drat à Filelt Alors, ça, c'est une question précise. So, Mr. Ambassador, does the Morocco-UK Association Agreement also apply to Gibraltar companies? Right. I'm just trying to check. I'm unmuted. Yeah. No. Um, so, uh, the, an the answer is that, uh, that the UK-Morocco uh, Association Agreement applies to rather than to the um, overseas uh, territories, uh, which includes Gibraltar. However, having said that, I have never seen anything that suggests that there is a uh, um, that there is any great impediment to trade between Morocco uh, and Gibraltar, and there's enormous enthusiasm and affection in Gibraltar for Morocco. Uh, so. Um, uh, Laundry mentioned uh, earlier on the uh, the interest we have now from two different companies to set up um, a direct uh, ferry service between Tanger Med and England. But in fact, the uh, the, the ferry service between uh, Tangier and Gibraltar has already resumed um, after COVID. Um, and so uh, there is a there is there is a strong traditional uh, connection. There is a there is a substantial Moroccan community in Gibraltar, um, and so um, I'm uh, we 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 of course uh, are responsible. I am responsible for the external relations of of, of Gibraltar in, uh, in in Morocco as well. And so uh, I do, uh, if you like, I am Gibraltar's ambassador as well as the British ambassador, uh, and so. For uh, any Gibraltar companies, I'm very happy to uh, to, to to take up uh, any uh, any issues that they have. But as I say, the Gibraltar government is already uh, very active in in uh, in promoting um, the the trade and indeed the investment relationship with uh, with Morocco. Um, and there's a there's a there's a powerful Gibraltar representation in Tangier. Euh, monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon Martin, encore une question. Alors cette fois-ci, ça a trait euh, justement au projet X-Links. 
euh, question de Hazard nous pose la question suivante. Est-ce que vous diriez euh, que ce, ce projet est un peu l'équivalent du, du, du projet de TGV Casablanca, euh, Casablanca Tanger pour la France, autrement dit un projet porteur d'une nouvelle relation euh, avec plus d'impulsion entre deux pays, entre en l'occurrence le Royaume-Uni et le Maroc. So, Mr. Ambassador, do you think the um, X-Link project is the equivalent of the um, TGV project between Morocco and France um, that have a new dimension, I would say? It, 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 is, it, it is a project that, that, that brings not only a new dimension, but a, a, but a uh, the potential for transformative change um, uh, in the UK Morocco uh, relationship, um, and I think it's I think it's particularly um, noticeable um, that at this time when when the world is looking to decarbonize its industry um, and to transfer as quickly as possible to renewable energies. That this is a proposal that that, that derives from the UK um, uh, and is scheduled to be fully private sector funded, and it's something that uh, that Simon is quite modest about. But but uh, I am very proud that that Britain is able to produce such a spectacularly um, uh, ambitious proposal, um, and and that the uh, and in a way that that allows the it to be private sector funded because this is exactly how we will bring about this green transition um across the world and particularly here in africa so uh, so the answer is yes but uh, i would uh, i would go i would go beyond that because as simon has said the the potential is making a noise and I shall shut it up for you um, uh, that the uh, that the that the that the poten the ground breaking potential um, of the of the excellence project that Simon has just set out for us goes far beyond that of a major infrastructure project fantastic though the LGV between uh, Casablanca and Tanger is and uh, and it's a it's a real revelation to to all of us who use it and we can't wait to see the uh, uh, the extension uh, further south um, and um, a huge amount of interest from from not just from British companies but from uh, from many other companies looking to partner with British companies at our reception for UK export finance in, in Rabat last night um, but uh, but this uh, I think Simon will agree uh, is something of a of a different uh, of, it, it's a uh, it's a game changer rather than just moving things along a bit um it, it has the potential to be transformative not just of the uk morocco relationship but as simon has said it will be it, it will it will take that into a completely new order of magnitude but it actually has the the the, the potential for for changing the way the world looks at its green transition Merci, M. l'ambassadeur Simon Martin. Alors, on a des questions également pour, pour vous, hein, Tom Hill. Je rappelle, directeur euh, ici euh, du DIT au Maroc et consul général du, du Royaume-Uni. Tom Hill, euh, une question de, de Mustafa qui, qui demande la valeur ajoutée de cet accord d'association euh, Maroc-Royaume-Uni pour les PME marocaines, les petites et moyennes entreprises marocaines. So, Tom, um, what added value does this agreement constitute for Moroccan SMEs? Well, I mean, I suppose um, the the main thing is if you're if you're a Moroccan exporter, um, there is a, a wide array of um, HS codes of products that you can export to the UK um, tariff free. Um, so if you're in the agricultural sector, um, this association agreement means that you know you, you can compete with. UK producers, um, uh, you know, you have better tariff um, rates than a, a, a very, very large number of other exporters into the UK. Um, so, you know, there's good for Moroccan exporters and, and good for UK consumers because it's uh, um, it's it's cheaper to get Moroccan tomatoes from um, from your supermarket uh, in the UK. So, uh, that's one benefit if you're an exporter. 
the, the 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 other benefits are you know one of the things that we talk about a lot with in Morocco is, is partnership um, and SMEs uh, you know should they want to sort of grow their business with the help of uh, UK expertise UK machinery um, it's easier to do that as well because because of course the uh, the association agreement goes the other way as well um, and then finally as I said um, the points around kind of facilitating smoother trade so one of the things that we we do regularly is um, work with Morocco to make sure that if you are engaging in international trade um, it's you know the barriers are ironed out so some of the things that we've recently uh, engaged on is a project um, to make uh, it easier to produce electric vehicles in Morocco if you're if you're um, bringing together uh, parts from across the UK and Europe. Uh, other issues around sort of labelling on on particular goods or um, uh, importation certificates for uh, for meat into the UK. So these are all things that have been reported to us from businesses, uh, and through this framework with Morocco, we've been able to uh, to address them or move towards addressing them. So um, yeah, I think the. The benefits for SMEs are just as substantial as, as the benefits for sort of any other business. Um, uh, and I think the benefits of working with the UK uh, hopefully are clear to sort of most of the members on this call. But, um, you know, doing that is uh, is easier because of this agreement. Merci, Thomas Hill. Alors, il y a une autre question, une autre question de Younes cette fois-ci, uh, qui, uh, qui se pose des questions sur l'hydrogène vert. Est-ce qu'il y a des axes de coopération en matière d'hydrogène vert pour l'instant? So Tom, uh, are there any areas of cooperation on the green hydrogen? Yeah, uh, well, green hydrogen uh, definitely, and Simon may want well wants to sort of um, share thoughts on this as well. But um, I mean, as Simon said, the, the generation capacity in Morocco is huge. Um, uh, and that's the first thing that you need in order to, to create a green hydrogen. Uh, another th another thing that Morocco has going for it is uh, it has a very large um, offtaker of ammonia, which is another um, uh, byproduct of green hydrogen in OCP. So you have both the generation capacity and the market. Um, uh, and and you know, finally, you've also got the proximity to uh, a very hungry continent, energy hungry continent, um, that doesn't have its own gener uh, generation capacity. So I, I was in Marrakesh in uh, in June at Power to X Summit, um, and half of Europe was there. To be honest, um, half of the embassies were there to uh, work with Morocco and try and um, try and get some first mover advantage in this sector. So th so there's huge advantage, um, a lot of appetite from the UK. Um, we've got some of the UK's largest uh, power companies uh, coming into Morocco. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that we would like to do and, and work with Morocco on is, uh, you know, some sort of sector-wide framework and um, sector-wide facilitation so that we can we can start to approach this at a more strategic level. But um, I mean, yeah, huge potential. I think Morocco is as well placed as any as anyone um, to to produce and supply green hydrogen into Europe. Yeah, and if, if I can add add on that, um, so I mean, the, Morocco Morocco has was not blessed with fossil fuel resources, uh, unlike many other um, countries in North Africa and, uh, and the Middle East. Um, it is blessed with amazing renewable resources, and so uh, even further south, as you go further south into Morocco, um, <clears throat> you, you know what the, the the wind and the solar gets even better. Um, on that, and so th th these are places where which will be absolutely perfect for uh, the large-scale generation of hydrogen. Uh, and we've got three sites on just surrounding us on here. Um, what is also important to understand about hydrogen is is not to let it be overhyped either. So I would highly recommend anybody looking into hydrogen should understand Michael Liebrich's hydrogen ladder. And there are there is a huge amount of hydrogen required. To, to replace current hydrogen production, which comes from the sort of cracking of fossil fuels. That is enormous and the requirement for that is huge. Um, however, there are also a ton of uses that people talk about hydrogen from 
um, from vehicles to uh, home heating to electricity grids where actually hydrogen is really not the most effective way of, of doing it. And so when you're talking about vehicles, um, that will all be that will almost all be batteries. Um, uh, when you're talking about home heating, that will almost be um, uh, that will be heat pumps. And when you're talking about electricity grids, again, it will be um, solutions like um, uh, like X-Links. Our, our round trip efficiency, so the losses on the cable um, between Morocco and the UK are 13 percent and our round trip efficiency is 85 percent. The round trip efficiency of hydrogen, once you look at the electrolysis, the um, compression, the storage, the transportation, and the conversion back into electricity again, is around about 30 to 35 percent. So when you do the maths, we can produce electricity for X links at half, that's less than half the price of being able to do it via hydrogen as a route. And so that just, um, it hopefully, it gives you an idea in terms of the relative benefits of of hydrogen um, in, in, and, and what hydrogen needs to be focused on, um, and, and, and that, that hopefully is helpful. Uh, Simon Maurice, justement, une question cette fois-ci de, de Wafa qui demande uh, quels sont les, les principaux défis auxquels vous faites face pour l'instant pour uh, réellement démarrer le, le projet X-Links et, et à quand peut-être l'installation des premiers câbles? So, uh, Simon, what are the main challenges to, um, to begin this project? And um, also, uh, do you think um, the, the discussion with the, the UK government, which is slow, can affect the general trust around the project? Yeah, so I, I think I think the largest challenge um, is is sort of on the political front is just getting that moving forward faster um, uh, for faster. And I and I think Simon sort of referred to it earlier. I don't think we helped ourselves in the UK with with what's been going on politically in the last last six months. And so that that certainly hasn't helped not only our project, but I think a ton of other things that were, were going on on there. And I think whenever you get change or disruption, that sort of uh, that puts a bit of a spanner in the works. Um, I'm I'm comfortable and confident that things are settling back down to normal again. And so that that that's a that's a um, uh, that, that's a good place to be. I think the second largest challenge is the is the actual manufacture of the cable itself. And here there is not enough supply, and so we are um, we are needing to build the cable um, uh, factories to actually be able to deliver that supply. And so we're looking at doing that um, uh, in the UK, right next to Hunterston uh, Power Station or the nuclear power plant that's shutting down at the moment. So um, that that would be my my two top issues for um, for complexity. The rest is just fitting the pieces of the puzzle together. It's all been done before. There's no technological challenges. We're not creating something new. Um, we, we are just fitting a large, sort of a large puzzle together. And, um, and that has complexity in itself. Merci, uh, Simon Morish. Alors, peut-être une dernière question pour vous, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Question de, de Ahmed qui se pose la question. Uh, comment vous percevez uh, les, les échanges futurs entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni d'ici cinq ans. Euh, C'est vrai que tout à l'heure, je rappelais qu'on a quasiment atteint les 2 milliards euh, euh, de livres sterling d'échanges commerciaux et économiques en 2021. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut dépasser cette barre des 2 milliards dès cette année Oh, Mr. Ambassador, how do you perceive the exchange between Morocco and the UK in the next five years Um, I love the question. Thank you. And um, I, uh, I would love to be here in five years time to, 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 uh, to justify my answer. Um, I, uh, I can't predict with any certainty what the, what the scale will be. But like Simon, um, <clears throat> I am confident that we will see both the UK and Morocco becoming increasingly important uh, trading and, and indeed broader economic partners, uh, which will be seen by, by, you know, by in terms of the numbers, uh, the volume of trade, the uh, 
where we where we are in each other's list of priority trading partners and also the volume of of investment not just british investment in morocco um, but also moroccan investment um, in the uk and um, uh, so i would uh, i think it is reasonable for for um, the uk to aspire to be, um, uh, at least on a level um, uh, with uh, some of Morocco's other major European trading partners. Um, and we're not at the moment. And as I said earlier on, um, the UK and Morocco, for a whole variety of reasons, um, have, have, not, have, have rather overlooked the opportunity of our relationship for a very long time. Um, and we are both now committed to, to, to putting that right because we see so much mutual benefit from it. So uh, in the next five years time, will we see uh, trade doubled and, uh, and investment doubled? I very much hope we will. Uh, I hope Tom agrees with me that it is a reasonable aspiration. Um, governments and, and, uh, and diplomats like us, uh, we believe we can play a positive role in, in supporting that. Um, but it is the decisions of the private sector who will who will deliver that. Um, we're trying to use uh, the the structures and the relationship that we have created between our two governments to facilitate that, to facilitate that level of um, of. Uh, uh, of, of increase in our economic exchanges, uh, which will be delivered in large part by the private sector, but also supported by judicious use of uh, um, of government funding. For example, as I mentioned earlier on, British international investment and uh, uh, and the UK export finance. So, yeah, I think it is it is reasonable for us to to aspire in five years' time to at least have doubled our trade and our investment figures. And as Simon says, um, there is also the potential for far exceeding that if we get everything right. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Bien, merci, merci à tous. On voit qu'il y a beaucoup de perspectives euh, d'évolution et de confiance entre le Maroc et, et le Royaume-Uni. Prenons les chiffres qu'on a présentés euh, ce soir, mais prenons également le, le, le discours qu'on a entendu ce soir avec nos, nos trois interventions, nos trois intervenants, pardon. Euh, on sent qu'il y a beaucoup de potentiel de développement, notamment dans la finance, dans l'agriculture. Dans la culture, c'est déjà le cas, mais ça va encore davantage se renforcer. Dans les énergies renouvelables, on voit un magnifique projet qui, euh, qui commence à se dessiner et qui va sans doute se, se concrétiser. En tout cas, ce sera peut-être un des projets les plus ambitieux euh, de la décennie qui, qui arrive. Merci beaucoup. Thanks, à, à Simon Moish. À très bientôt. Je rappelle que vous êtes directeur général de X-Links. Thomas Hill également. Merci beaucoup. À très bientôt. Consul général du, du Royaume-Uni et directeur euh, général du DIT ici au Maroc. Monsieur l'ambassadeur Simon euh, Martin, à bientôt également. Merci beaucoup. Oui, et également. Merci beaucoup. C'était mon plaisir. Merci à Merci. tous d'avoir suivi ce webinaire et bonne soirée à tous. À très bientôt pour un prochain webinaire de la Chambre britannique.